Okay, so the goal of this monitoring is to evaluate the status and changes in riparian and in-stream habitat conditions and OASF watersheds that are managed by DNR for multiple values, including timber, fish and wildlife habitat, and other ecosystem values. This project was initiated in 2012. We completed the first round of monitoring across all the watersheds in 2015. In 2015, we also initiated a uh, validation monitoring. This is led by Kyle Martins, a uh, fish biologist with the team. And this is focused on salmonids um, within these same streams that I'll be talking about today. And just this past year in 2020, we completed the um, fifth year of sampling. So the hypothesis under which um, riparian management occurs in the OESF is that habitat will improve over time through passive restoration. And this is the uh, theoretical view. And when I say improve, we're refer referring to the um, initial degraded habitat condition of streams and riparian areas following uh, intensive harvests during the peaks during the 1960s through 80s when there were uh, minimal um, conservation practices in place. And we expect that over time, uh, habitat will improve across these watersheds and broaden the um, distribution here. And um, when I say passive restoration, I'm referring to the fact that uh, we have unharvested stream buffers of, of at least 100 feet and often more um, around the small streams on the OESF. And the idea is that natural processes over time will lead to improved habitat. So the monitoring design, we're focused on type three streams, which are the smallest uh, fish bearing streams and the watersheds that surround these type three streams. We focus our monitoring at the watershed outlet. And the idea there is that anything that happens within this watershed effects will appear at the outlet. Watersheds uh, average a little over 500 acres in size. We have um, 50 watersheds that we're monitoring across DNR managed state lands in the OESF. We also um, receive some federal funding and we monitor 12 um, unharvested watersheds. These are ones that have never been harvested. Uh, most of them occur on federal lands. And the reason behind monitoring these is to understand changes over time in habitat conditions in the absence of active, of any sort of management. Um, and so looking at the 50 watersheds that we are monitoring, I ran some numbers, and since monitoring started in 2013, 4% uh, of those land based on those 50 were thinned, 2.5% uh, had regeneration harvest, and there was no rip riparian harvest uh, in these 50 watersheds since monitoring. That's So no allotted acres were harvested. So to understand riparian and aquatic habitat, in these watersheds, we look at nine different indicators. Uh, most of these are focused uh, on streams uh, and relate to salmonid habitat, but we also measure some terrestrial indicators too. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, um, I'll just be focusing on four of these. So the first one is water temperature. We monitor water temperature in all the watersheds year round. Um, it's recorded every hour um, by these small data loggers. I'm not going to get into a lot of uh, statistical results today, but I will show a number of these distribution graphs. And this, the two curves on this graph represent the, the 50 DNR managed watersheds um, and their distribution in relation to different variables I'll be showing. Uh, those, there's two curves here. Uh, the silver one is the first measurement that we took, and then this uh, other color here, whatever it is, um, is our last measure five years later. So we're looking at a five-year interval between these two curves. And this variable is uh, a commonly used stream temperature variable, the maximum weekly, max daily temperature. In other words, we record the maximum temperature in the stream every single day. And this is the seven-day period during the summer when that is at its hottest. So this is as hot as these streams get. And first thing I want to point out is that these curves are basically right on top of each other. The dashed lines represent the average of both. And so we can see at the beginning and end of our monitoring period, there was essentially no change in stream temperature. And we also see that these, these averages line up right around 14 C, which equals uh, 57 degrees Fahrenheit. So the streams are, are quite cool. 
Um, looking more detail at this change over time, of course, with annual changes in weather, we do have ups and downs in that maximum temperature metric, but long-term, we're not seeing any change. And, uh, and again, the good news is these streams are quite cool at, at 14 degrees C on average at their peak. So one reason the streams are so cool is because these watersheds are, are located fairly close to the ocean. And so there's that maritime climate influence. But another important factor is stream shade. Uh, we measure stream shade in all of uh, these sample reaches at six different points using hemispherical photography. We process the photos and um, get percent canopy closure or percent shade. And the resulting value is, is transformed so it's equivalent to what you would get with a densiometer. So looking at, at the canopy closure or shade in these streams, it's these really quite dense. We have uh, 93, 94% canopy closure. There's actually a slight but significant um, increase in shade during the five year monitoring period. And again, we're, we're talking about some very densely shaded streams. Now I'm gonna overlay a graph from those 12 unharvested watersheds to see how that compares. Um, and th this orange line here represents those and they're still very shady, but you can see there's a little bit broader distribution and a little bit more sunlight actually in those watersheds that have never been harvested. And this is actually what we'd expect because um, those are more commonly uh, characterized by older forests. And when a forest um, reaches that age, the, the canopy structure begins to diversify and there's more gaps. So this, this is what we would expect in those uh, older forests. So let's talk a little more about the riparian forest overstory. So we installed two plots on every one of our uh, sample reaches, one plot on each side of the stream. And the reason for this is because often the management history differs on, on either side of a stream. So we wanna capture both sides. And we measure all the trees on each plot. So that, that provides us with a lot of data. So we have 120 different plots to characterize. So uh, we thought the best approach would be to group these by the forest structure. Um, so we use multivariate analysis to group them. And we use six variables, three each for conifers and hardwoods in this analysis. We use trees per acre, basal area per acre, and uh, average diameter or QMD of conifers and hardwoods. And so based on those six variables, uh, we came up with these four groups that were pretty distinctive. And I try to summarize the four groups here. I give them nicknames. And here's a, a photo of a typical situation in each of these four forest structure groups. Um, and the nicknames I've given them are small conifer, conifer, alder heavy, and large conifer. And just to point out a few highlights here, small conifer is not really that small. They're, they're 11 inches diameter, but they're, the stands are quite dense. Um, our regular conifer, they're, they're a bit larger at 15 inches average diameter. This alder heavy is stands um, where alder really dominated the, the regeneration and it, it still dominates the stands. Um, and so, Alder is a uh, early successional species and it will naturally uh, regenerate first on these um, riparian forests, especially where there's disturbances. So the fourth category is uh, large conifer and these have an average diameter of 21 inches and there's actually some, a lot of trees that are larger than that. And I wanna point out a couple things here. The first is the distribution of our plots among these four groups. So first looking at the unharvested watersheds, mostly on federal lands, um, here most of the plots fell into this large conifer category as you might expect. These are older forests. But then within the DNR managed watersheds, um, we see actually over a third of our plots fell into that large conifer class. Um, and this is uh, a result of, uh, these are legacies of, of past um, harvest planning in many areas, um, trees, were left along streams. Um, so this reflects some of that older, uh, larger conifer condition. So the second point I wanna make is that there's really a, a diversity of riparian forest types here in the DNR managed watersheds. So whatever type of, of management is applied, um, you know, ha has to consider the fact that, that we really have a diversity of forest types along these type three streams. 
So a related variable that we looked at is in-stream wood. Um, in-stream wood is, is vital for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, it has a huge effect on the morphology of the stream channel. Um, it slows down the speed of the water. It traps sediment. Um, and importantly, it, it creates pools that are ideal for fish. And so I'm going to show a couple the distributions of uh, a couple different uh, in-stream wood variables that we measured. Uh, the first one is just the frequency of pieces. How many pieces of wood are there? Uh, and these are four inches diameter and larger pieces uh, per 100 meters of stream length. So we actually saw between our first and last measurement, the distribution shifted a little bit. Um, there, we found uh, slightly fewer pieces of in-stream wood, about six or seven pieces per 100 meters fewer in our second measurement um, compared to our first measurement five years earlier. Um, if we look at large pieces, these are pieces that are uh, 20 inches diameter and larger. So they, these are really key pieces in affecting the, the uh, stream channel. Um, we also saw a shift there, um, a slight negative shift um, in the number of pieces of wood. And this may be because large pieces are, are decaying or breaking up, um, it's one possibility. Uh, this curve here compares the diameter of pieces, the average diameter, or QMD, of in-stream wood between the first and last measurement. And we saw, again, we saw a slight decrease. This could be because of losses of large pieces of wood, or even potentially um, a, another factor could be more small pieces of wood coming into the system. But to try to understand this, this change, we, we looked at another, another variable that we measured, and that is the decay class of this in-stream wood. And we, class, we have four decay classes. We classify every single piece of wood um, based on its level of decay. The least decayed are still going to have uh, limbs and twigs. These are recently fallen trees that have recently entered the stream. And then our most decayed wood uh, is, um, you know, is so decayed that you can pull it apart with your bare hands. That would be class four whereas the least decayed is class one. So if we look at a breakdown of this, I, I really just want to point out one thing on this graph. Uh, looking at our DNR managed watersheds and those 12 unharvested watersheds, and I want to point out the largest diameter class. These are five different diameter classes of in-stream wood. Looking at that largest class, the 80 plus centimeters or 30 plus inches, um, we, we see in our our DNR watersheds that um, actually 80% of those large pieces are in the higher decay classes, so they're more decayed. Um, and only 20% are, are in the lesser decay classes. But if we look at over at the unharvested watersheds, um, we find that there's actually only 45% uh, of this highly decayed large wood. Um, and there's more uh, undecayed wood entering the system. So so this may be, um, it's probably likely a result of the fact that uh, there are snags falling over, um, or, uh, wind throw, and uh, basically just larger trees entering the stream system here. And with two thirds of the plots in um, medium to, to younger age kind of for forest, we just don't have that input of these very large trees. Uh, at present within the DNR managed watersheds. So to, to tie these different variables together, um, I want to point out that we did see a, a real diversity of forest types in, in DNR's managed watersheds in the riparian forest. Um, across all of these, though, the forest canopy was, was quite dense, and that led to a high level of stream shading, consist, very consistently high level of shading. And one result of this is uh, certainly cool stream temperatures um, within an optimal range for the salmonid species that we see. The other variable that, that we saw some evidence of, of decline was large wood. And uh, our fish biologist Kyle Martins has actually led the uh, publication of two recent papers on that both address this issue. Um, the cycle of wood inputs and um, loss of wood from the systems over time. And Kyle will also be speaking later this morning uh, about one potential way to address this issue of loss of wood, and that would be through 
active restoration. So uh, that's all I have this morning. I'd like to um, acknowledge many, many people who assisted with this project. Thank you.